starting a family is a dream for many couples, but for others, it can be a struggle as millions of Americans face infertility. Today, we will explore tips on conceiving, discuss options to consider if infertility becomes a factor, and even debunk some of the myths. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikki Mohan, your host for today's discussion, coming to you from the Baptist Health Newsroom. Today, we are joined by IVF specialist, Dr. Jurgen Eiserman. Great to have you here, Dr. Eiserman. And we're also joined by OBGYN at Baptist Health South Miami, Dr. Natalia Echeverry. Happy to have you both. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So looking forward to getting into this important discussion. Um, you know, I want to, before we dive into today's subject, though, I want to remind all of you watching, send in your questions and comments in our comments section throughout this discussion. We're here for you and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. We're going to start off with Dr. Echeverry. Um, starting a family can be really stressful for some, you know, and you know this, you're a mother of three. Yes. In order to ha ease that stress, um, how can someone increase their chances of getting pregnant? What do you advise when a, a patient comes to you and says, I'm ready? So we usually advise for them to come into something called a preconception visit. And in that visit, we're going to go over the menstrual history, the menstrual calendar. And I really recommend they do have either an app, since now we all use phones, or to keep it on their physical calendar to see when they're menstruating. That way we can better track ovulation. I also recommend that we go over the chronic medical conditions. A lot of time, hypertension, diabetes, or thyroid disease can have a very big factor in infertility, so we want to make sure that everything's under control. Lastly, we want to review medications that they're on to make sure that they're safe in pregnancy or trying to get pregnant. And we want to start them on prenatal vitamins. Yeah. The last thing is going over when to have intercourse in order to really increase your chances of getting pregnant. Yeah. No, um, Dr. Eisenman, if they can't make it with, uh, <laughs> with this lady, they're coming to you. Um, people facing infertility do have options available, though, and as you know well, to help them conceive. One prevalent option we talk about is IVF or in vitro fertilization. Um, how does it work and what exactly is it? First of all, there are many ways that lead to Rome. You can take the country <laughs> road, you can take the highway, or you can take the helicopter. <laughs> IVF is the helicopter. <laughs> when the stress becomes too uh, consuming, when frustration kicks in, when nothing seems to help. IVF is a way to go. IVF was originally started in 1978, the first baby born, Louise Brown, 78, wow. by a gentleman that actually received the Nobel Prize for his efforts at the wow. time. And um, now IVF, of course, is not only used for tubal disease and for male factor infertility, but also for a number of other reasons. It's starting out with the frustration, not being able to get pregnant, nothing works, or wanting to minimize risk in polycystic ovarian disease, avoid triplets or quadruplets. You can actually produce the embryos in the lab and then transfer one at a time or you have a severe male factor, for example, or the husband walks in the door and says, <clears throat> we've just been recently married, and I had a tubal, uh, I had a, a vasectomy, and I don't want to have to go through the reversal. So we tap the sperm and we create an embryo or embryos that way. Many other indications, recurrent pregnancy loss for, for unknown reasons or chromosomal abnormalities, we test the embryos before they go back in the patient. So, that's IVF for you these days. We are <clears throat> looking at over 10 million IVF babies born worldwide at this point in time from this procedure. And wow. We've been doing this at South Miami. So you're South solving Miami. the world's population crisis in, in one go. <laughs> we've been doing this at South Miami since uh, 1991. That's amazing. That's amazing. And back to Dr. Echeverry. You know, the journey to, uh, to conception really varies for everyone. At what point do you tell them to seek additional help? Like go to a Dr. Eiserman. So absolutely, that's a really good question. Um, for women under, th it's actually age-based. So for women under 35, we give them 12 months before we have them seek additional help. For women under 40, it's six months. And over 40, we really tell them to get immediate assistance. So over 40. And we were seeing more and more people having babies over 40. Absolutely, times have changed. Yeah, yeah. family planning goals may require several years to finalize. Um, Dr. Eiserman, how long does the IVF process normally take? And um, and how long does success take? I mean, because that's what they want to know, right? When Absolutely. am I getting a baby? When do you come into your office? So once you decide you want to do IVF or you need to do IVF, uh, you got to be prepared for a two menstrual cycle preparation and treatment. First menstrual cycle, 
you meet with the counselor, you meet with, you get your medication review, you get your consent form signed, you get your schedule, you get your injection classes because it's injectable medication. Then you get started on the treatment, which is another menstrual cycle, so to speak, 10 days of treatment, daily injections of pituitary hormones, followed by ultrasounds, blood tests. Then the actual retrieval, you're sleeping for about a 20 minute procedure to retrieve the eggs transvaginally. And then you wait for your period. Now, that's where it becomes more differentiated. Some patients have their embryos tested and put in the freezer to find out, first of all, which ones are the ones that are chromosomally normal, which ones are not. Also, which ones have a genetic condition and which ones are, are not affected by a genetic condition that you want to avoid, for example, cystic fibrosis or congenital adrenal hyperplasia or, or Tay-Sachs, for example. We test these embryos before they go in for you to be able to have a healthy baby. So then the preparation step for the frozen embryo transfer is another month and a half. So it is, I wouldn't call it brief, but it's definitely well defined. You have a defined outcome. 60 to 65% live birth rate per frozen embryo transfer is what you should expect. Wow. And if you have additional embryos in the freezer, well, you can come back in a year or two or three. Why yeah, not? why not, right? Yep. Yeah. Dr. Echeverry should know well. She's three. I have three of them. <laughs> there are myths surrounding the idea of getting <laughs> pregnant. You know, do you know of any old wives' tales? that we've heard throughout the years, throughout our communities. You're from Colombia. Yes. I'm from the Caribbean. There's so many, you know, we know you're having a boy if you look like this. So if you want to have a girl, do this. But how many of um, the old wives' tales are true? They're really not true. <laughs> so actually, when, She's like zero. when I was preparing for this, um, I looked up. I, I decided to just do a quick Google search of what are those old wives' tales out there. The number one hit was birth control. Birth control makes you infertile. Birth control does not make you infertile. It basically puts a pause on fertility so you do not get pregnant, which is the purpose of birth control for a lot of women. I don't, I'm not currently ready to get pregnant. However, when you discontinue the birth control, let it be pills or an IUD, your fertility does come back, okay? That's the first thing. The second one that I heard a lot was you should elevate your pelvis or your legs after intercourse in order to become pregnant. Again, that's not true. The, the sperm does, does not, defy gravity it it does it on its own there's no need to, no need to help it yes um <laughs> another good one was i cannot get pregnant at all from breastfeeding uh -huh. of course that is not true as well i have had many patients come in being you know three months postpartum and positive pregnancy tests but aren't you more susceptible to getting pregnant after having a baby no no that's, that's not true either that's not true either okay yes uh, what else did I read about? Um, the breastfeeding, the birth control one, that was a big one. And then depending on when you have intercourse, you can either define if it's a girl or a boy. I tried it. I have two boys. <laughs> Finally, I had my girl via IVF, though. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, 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 that's amazing because you can talk, you know, as a patient, as a doctor and a patient, yes. which is um, so, which has probably made you so much more empathetic. 100%. To all of the people coming into your office. Um, you know, back to Dr. Eisman, now... IVF can be a really lengthy taxing process. How can someone maximize the chances of a successful IVF outcome? Because they're already stressed, right? They're stressed, they come in, we can't have a baby, we really want this baby. And then they, they come to you and say, work your magic. You can set an endpoint. If you do IVF, you know two months to three months later, you'll know whether or not you're pregnant. So it's not that bad. First of all, I think you gotta get your financial ducks in line. You gotta find out what insurance coverage you have. Uh, how can you get financing done? You're looking at 15 to sometimes up to $25,000 for a treatment cycle, depending on the frills that you add, pre-implantation, genetic testing, biopsy of the embryos, and, and so forth. But the smart thing is to do uh, your homework before. You look at uh, whichever program seems to have the better stats. There is a... Um, Society for Assisted Reproduction Technology in the United States. We are being monitored in terms of outcome. You can look up the statistics on birth rates uh, per treatment cycle, per embryo transfer, and so forth. So I do recommend that uh, to be done before. Good preparation is the mother of success. You don't run into a cycle without looking first for potential obstacles that can reduce your chance to be successful. And I think you alluded that uh, on that before. Uh, how do you get ready for a successful pregnancy? First of all, you do your genetic screens. You look for, make sure you're immune to German measles and chicken pox. Make sure your vitamin D level is okay. Make sure your thyroid function works. Your metabolism, 
mentioned that beforehand. So preparing yourself properly is super important. And then once you decide to do it, uh, look at your potential odds. Uh, you have uh, testing available right now. For example, we do the so-called AMH level, the anti-malarian hormone. Wow. It gives you an idea how much reproductive gas you have in your tank. Wow, I you see, see you nodding your eggs. head. Because you went through this for your, your current two-year-old. You Absolutely. You had IVF. Yes, and I did it in my early 30s. I decided to undergo IVF and um, make embryos, essentially. Um, and my AMH, as he was saying, was actually low, even though I was very young. I was, you know, in my eyes, I was only 32. But my AMH was low, and I, we were only able to get six healthy embryos. Wow. And, and that, was, that was a shock to you, right? It was. It was definitely a shock. I, I felt young and healthy. Yeah. And you say that a lot of people, a lot more people are coming into free cerex, and for so many reasons now. Yes. Obviously, uh, you can stop the clock. And you tell me, I mean, I see so many women in their mid to late 30s, and they wake up in the morning, and they hear the clock ticking, and they say, okay. And when you have them in the office and you ask them, how old are you? Nine out of 10 will tell you how old they will be, not how old they are. Wow. Tells you something, what's yes. going on in their mind, right? And yes, age is a, is a definite uh, factor in terms of chance for outcome, chance for potential for outcome. Chromosomal normality of an embryo, the incidence drops with age significantly yeah. potentially so that's where the pre-implantation genetic testing comes into place that's we pre-select the chromosomally normal embryos for an embryo transfer so that's what IVF can do for you and I think at some point in time once you made the decision to go there um, the odds are definitely going to be in your favor if you have the financial strengths to continue to do what you need to do and be persistent enough. And for us, of course, to look at obstacles beforehand, endometriosis, metabolic issues, thyroid problems, vitamin D deficiencies, for example, or as you mentioned before, hypertension and diabetes and overweight. That's yeah. one of our bigger obstacles. Being prepared means you work on that first. I always tell patients, I say, okay, we will check you out. No panic on the Titanic, okay? We, <laughs> <laughs> we will make sure that we don't have to later on say, ah, it didn't work because we should have done this and this and this and that. Whether it's your immune system, whether it's your metabolism, whether it's your glucose management, whether it's your weight, all these kind of things yeah. play a big role. And you said financially, you've seen insurance, insurance companies do better. Yes. You know. Absolutely. There are a bunch of plans out there that you shouldn't explore. We're participating in the large, uh, in the large majority of them. And we're proud to do that, of course. We're happy to do it because it reduces the stress. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And, it, and it's a win-win for everybody because you, you, you want to see that person succeed. Correct. You know? We can't look good unless they look good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, you say you froze your eggs at one point. So I froze embryos. You froze your embryos. Yes. So it's already the egg and the sperm joins. Yeah. I froze five-day embryos that we knew were genetically normal. Wow. I was looking for the girl. I only got one. And you got your girl. I got my girl, though. She's here. Congratulations. How do you call that? Lucky? <laughs> I'm very lucky. Oh, cool. <laughs> I had five boys and one girl. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. As, as Thomas Alpha Edison said, the harder you try, the luckier you get. Absolutely. <laughs> now, so, how long does that so. process, how does the process of freezing embryos work? And what do you advise your patients to do when they come, Dr. Arsene? Okay. Uh, the majority of our patients, thank God, have more than one embryo resulting from their treatment. And we always, nowadays, like to stick to a single embryo transfer, because especially if they've been tested before and they're chromosomally normal, as I said before, 60, almost 70% take home baby rate. So we like, to have them frozen. We do not do long-term freezing in our facility, but at $400 a year, you can freeze your embryos in any facility that is specially monitoring your embryos is a safe choice to keep them long-term. Yeah, no. So, and then you come back a year or two or three later. Yeah, are we talking about, we're talking about all the, the science and the physical, let's talk about the emotional and psychological factors that go into this. Because it's supposed to be like Mother Nature, right? Boy meets girl, they get married, then the baby comes next. It's very stressful when during this process. 
What do you recommend? Do you recommend your patients seek counseling, Dr. Archibald? For the ones that are very anxious, especially for the ones that have had infertility um, issues in the past and they've been trying for many years, I do. I really think that counseling is always helpful. Um, for the ones that were doing it for different reasons, either because they're not ready to start a family and they want to wait a few years, or the ones that um, have a genetic issue that they were trying to avoid in a pregnancy, you know, they might not need counseling, but I do, I do encourage them to either join groups of other IVF patients, which are very widely available. Um, I love walks. I think yeah. it's the best thing. Getting out there at night. Also, it's healthy. I want them to be healthy. So getting out there, doing 30 minutes walks after dinner to clear their heads and really become ready. Or talking to other patients I've gone through this. I encourage, I'm very open about my IVF cycle with my patients and I encourage them to talk to me about it if they want to. And a lot of them do feel very comfortable. Um, it's hard. It's very emotional. It's it's uncertain at times. And those, you know, 12 to 14 days where you don't know if it worked or not, it's it's a roller coaster of emotions. Yeah. There is an organization called Resolve that is uh, has been around for years, for decades, consisting of patients that are supporting each other, sharing their experiences, being available on the phone to talk to you. Very helpful. Resolve. Yeah. For example. No, it's it's so it's so important. And, um, as far as my position is concerned, I always say when patients come to see me and it hasn't worked, they want to hear answers. They want to know why. I always tell them, well, I haven't had a single patient that's pregnant yet coming back to me wanting to know why they're pregnant. But yes, we do our homework and we find out why they might be pregnant as opposed to maybe you are not. So we analyze things. We create facts. We try to put uh, one point after another onto a list to improve their potential, to give them the perspective to be motivated to try again. With the proper angle in mind, we can fix this, we can optimize this. We've had an interesting experience, unexpected, maybe egg quality, embryo quality, whatsoever, try to learn from past experience. The emotional part is a big part, but if you can overlay that with facts and give them an angle on what to improve and how to focus on it, helps a lot. And we were joking before the before the broadcast about how sometimes people go on vacation and they come back pregnant. So they just sometimes it's just hard to relax when you're going through all these things that don't seem quite natural. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what is the optimal age to get pregnant? It seems like everyone's getting pregnant later. I mean, I had a baby at 35 and I was geriatric. I was like, geriatric? What is that? Now we hear people having babies at 50, 51. My grandmother, when they had, she had started her 12 kid journey. She was 17. She was married young. Um, the American College of OBGYN once had a campaign going about 10 years ago. Do you remember that? I did not. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was attacked from all sides, uh, trying to push people to get pregnant before an education. Before Now, 60% of all college graduates are women. What are they gonna do with their education? They're not going to sit at home changing diapers. They're going to go and have a career. Look at the woman next door to me here. <laughs> she is obviously, if, if you're not married and if you're planning for a career, um, then deferring pregnancy is, is definitely what's happening these days. Is there an ideal age to be pregnant? Obviously, when you're young and healthy, the odds of complications as a result of pregnancy go down. Yeah. And when you're older, they go up and the perinatologists will, will be busier for you and you're going to have to be careful about this and that. But uh, we do egg donation up to age 53. But yeah. we send them to the cardiologist first and to the perinatologist first. And we do a single embryo transfer. Yeah. And we screen them very carefully in terms of their metabolism. So it works. It's not ever guaranteed. But ideal ages to be pregnant, I would say somewhere around early to mid 30s. Yeah. So yeah biolog agree? biologically it's under 30 yeah. because after 30 our our egg quality decrease, mm -hmm. our fecundity decreases significantly as well, which means our ability to get pregnant. However, we live in a different age. We we have, you know, assistance to get pregnant in our 30s or even our early 40s and that's what we're here for to help you do that. Yeah. Well, we're so happy that they have you both. And that's why we do these things so we can have their information and know that whenever they're ready, whenever that is, You'll be there for them. Dr. Eisman, Dr. Echeverry, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. Um, thank you so much for your insight. And viewers, remember, please be sure to hit that subscribe button on our channel here. Keep up with the latest health and wellness information and tips from all our experts. You can also connect with us on social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, 
and even LinkedIn. For the latest news and information, of course, baptisthealth.net slash news. You can find a link there to all the episodes of the Baptist Health Talk podcast as well. On behalf of everyone at Baptist Health, stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for watching. Thank you.